everyone, this is the lecture video on photosynthesis. Our objectives for photosynthesis are to discuss the basic chemical pathway. You should know the input and output for each step in photosynthesis. And you should know the summary equation of photosynthesis, including the source and fate of the reactants and products. So, in nature, plants and other autotrophs are producers of the biosphere. These are the organisms that can convert light energy into chemical energy. And we call them photoautotrophs. That chemical energy is stored in high energy organic molecules like glucose. Heterotrophs, in contrast, have to consume those organic molecules from other organisms to get the energy and carbon that they need. Hetero means other, troph means to feed. They feed off other organisms. Auto, it means self. So autotrophs are self feeders. Some examples of photoautotrophs, in addition to plants, there's also algae, cyanobacteria, unicellular protists, and even some special purple sulfur bacteria that can do photosynthesis. Photosynthesis converts light energy into chemical energy in the form of food. Chloroplasts are the site of photosynthesis in plants. And they have this basic structure. I also discuss chloroplast structure in the lecture on cell types. Um, but they have two membranes. There's an outer membrane and an inner membrane. There are these disc structures called thylakoids, a stack of thylakoids we call a granum. And the thylakoids themselves are hollow inside, or they're filled with a fluid, but um, they're basically folded up membrane. And that's really important because they have a lot of surface area on that membrane, and that's where the reactions, some of the reactions for photosynthesis take place. Here's a nice little model. All right, so sites of photosynthesis. Not every cell in a plant has chloroplasts and does photosynthesis. Leaves are the primary light harvesting organs in most plants. Um, and so we see if we look at a cross section of a leaf, there's chloroplasts that are lining the upper surface of the leaf. And there are also stomata on the underside of the leaf. These stomata are like mouths. They can open and close to let gases in and out. And water vapor is also leaving every time the stoma opens. So plants regulate when they open their stomata to reduce water loss. All right, so chloroplasts are mainly found in the mesophyll cells of the leaf, the middle layer, especially towards the upper surface. Stomata are the pores in the leaf where CO2 enters and oxygen exits. Water vapor also exits through the stomata. And chlorophyll is the green pigment in the thylakoid membranes of the chloroplasts. All right, here's our basic summary equation for photosynthesis. You need to be able to reproduce this from memory. So there's six carbon dioxide gas molecules that come in through the stomata. They're gonna interact with six molecules of water, which plants pull up from their roots, good. And then light energy from the sun. When photosynthesis is all said and done, they yield a single molecule of glucose sugar and six oxygen gas molecules. It's a redox reaction where water split, electrons are transferred along with H plus ions to carbon dioxide gas, and that creates the sugar. <sighs> Tracking atoms through photosynthesis. There's evidence that chloroplasts split water molecules, and this has enabled researchers to track the atoms through the process of photosynthesis. So we've got our reactants here, carbon dioxide gas and H2O. The carbon 
from the CO2 ends up in the glucose molecule, right? There's also oxygen in the CO2. Some of that ends up on glucose. Some of that oxygen ends up in water. The water molecule that gets um, is a reactant for photosynthesis gets the hydrogens go to the glucose, hydrogens go to making more water, and the oxygen here is what produces the oxygen gas. All right, so you should have a photosynthesis model that looks very similar to this diagram. Please follow along and fill it in as we talk about what's happening. So Photosynthesis is broken down into two major types of reactions. There are light-dependent reactions. That's the photo part, right? So here's where the light comes in. These are the light reactions. They occur in that thylakoid membrane. And then the second part is the Calvin cycle or the light-independent reactions. These are reactions that don't require sunlight to occur at the moment, but they have to have the light dependent reactions occur first before the light independent reactions of the Calvin cycle can happen. And this is where the synthesis occurs. This is where the glucose sugar gets made. So the light dependent reactions convert solar energy to chemical energy in the form of ATP and NADPH. ATP is adenosine triphosphate. This is the energy currency in a cell. This is what it takes to get work done in a living cell. And NADPH, this is an electron carrier molecule. All right, so first let's talk just a moment about the nature of sunlight. So we know light is a form of energy and it's a type of electromagnetic radiation. The shorter the wavelength, lambda, the higher the energy it has. Visible light can be detected by the human eye. Light can be reflected, it can transmit through something, or it can be absorbed by a surface. So this is the electromagnetic spectrum. Remember we said the shorter the wavelength, so the further we go to the left, the more energy something has. And the further we go to the right, the longer the wavelength, the lower energy that that energy has. Within this little narrow band here of light that human eyes can perceive, we have shorter wavelength, higher energy purple light, all the way through the rainbow up to red light, has the longest wavelength of visible light and the lowest amount of energy. Now, if you've ever heard of like infrared cameras, these are cameras that depict heat, right? So heat is the next level on the spectrum that our eyes can't detect it, but our bodies can sense heat, right? And then to the left, shorter wavelengths than what we can see and more high energy are ultraviolet radiation. You can't see UV light. Some animals can, like honeybees and birds of prey. Um, we can't perceive them visually anyway, but we know they're there when we get sunburned, right? Okay, uh, so the light from the sun interacts with the chloroplasts. And in fact, the chloroplasts and the, the chlorophyll specifically are responding to certain wavelengths in the visible spectrum. So when sunlight hits the thylakoids in the chloroplast, some light is reflected and it's the green light that's reflected. That's why it looks green to our eyes. Some light also gets transmitted, and I think that's also some green light that comes through there as well. Some wavelengths of light actually get absorbed by the chlorophyll pigments on the thylakoid membranes. Photosynthetic pigments. So pigments absorb different wavelengths of light. That's what this Greek letter lambda means, wavelength. Chlorophyll absorb violet and blue and red light. They reflect green. So it's actually violet, blue, and red wavelengths of visible light that power photosynthesis. Chlorophyll A, 
Um, this one does those blue wavelengths of light. It does light reaction and converts solar energy to chemical energy. Chlorophyll B focuses more on the yellowish greenish colors and that conveys energy to chlorophyll A. Carotenoids are other pigments. They're involved in photoprotection and they broaden the color spectrum that's utilized for photosynthesis. So you'll need to know about these three types of pigment. Chlorophyll A, chlorophyll B, and carotenoids, and you'll want to be able to tell me what colors of light they absorb. All right, so for results, uh, oh, not results, let's look at the wavelengths of light that these different pigments absorb. So here we've got the vis visible spectrum of light again from 400 to 700 nanometers. And we see chlorophyll A has peak absorbance right here, this purplish blue color. And it also has a second peak down here in kind of a reddish orange light. Chlorophyll B absorbs more blue light and it has a second peak in the more like straight up orange color. Carotenoids have two peaks here of absorbance in blue and green light. So all these places where these peaks are high, those are colors of light that can be used and harvested by these pigments for photosynthesis. Now let's talk about the chemical reactions themselves. So electrons in the chlorophyll molecule are excited by the absorption of light. So this, the higher it is in this model, the more energy the electrons have. So we have a photon, a particle of light, that strikes a chlorophyll molecule in the chloroplast. Kind of like a trampoline, that's going to excite this electron and shoot it up to an excited energy state. As that electron falls back down to its ground state, it will release heat energy and a photon, so fluorescence. And we can see fluorescence is when chemicals glow. All right, chlorophyll is excited by the absorption of light from the sun. That solar energy is used to make ATP and NADPH to provide energy for the Calvin cycle or those light independent reactions. Water is split to replace the electrons and oxygen gas is formed. So when sunlight first comes in, it strikes photosystem two. This is where that electron gets bounced up in energy, like by a trampoline or if someone jumps on the other side of a seesaw. And it bounces up to a, a primary electron acceptor. It's gonna bounce down an electron transport chain here and produce some ATP. And then it's going to go to photosystem one where it gets bounced up again to an even higher, more excited energy state. And it bounces down a second electron transport chain where the electron is harvested on NADPH. So solar energy comes in, we get ATP out and NADPH out, which is going to carry the electron on to the light independent reactions that come next in the Calvin cycle. Here's a mechanical analogy. If you think of that photon coming in, striking one side of a seesaw, it causes that electron to be bounced up in energy. It rolls downhill, losing energy, but that energy does work along the way and produces ATP, which cells can use to get work done. The electron comes here, another photon strikes it, and it excites it again, and it gets put into a bucket, an electron carrier. All right, both cell respiration and photosynthesis use chemiosmosis to generate ATP. And it happens in the membranes of the thylakoid and the membrane of the mitochondria here. Same 
same process. For a more detailed explanation of chemiosmosis, watch the cell respiration lecture video. All right, so what I'd like you to do now is pause and write a short summary of the light reactions. What's the function of the light-dependent reactions? Where does it occur? What are the products of the light-dependent reactions? And, well, you don't know how they relate to the Calvin cycle yet. Circle back to that one. When you're ready, you can move on. All right, next we're going to talk about the Calvin cycle or the light independent reactions. They use the ATP and NADPH from the light dependent reactions to convert carbon dioxide gas into sugar. So the reactants are ATP, NADPH, and carbon dioxide gas. They produce a three carbon sugar called G3P And you can see that here. So here comes in three carbon dioxide, whoops, three carbon dioxide gas molecules come in. They reduce and produce one three carbon molecule. What's left continues to cycle as more carbon dioxide gas comes in. So the light dependent reactions are spitting out this G3P, a three carbon sugar. And if you remember back to our summary equation for photosynthesis, glucose sugar has six carbons. So I think you can probably make a prediction about what's going to happen with those G3P molecules to get up to a six carbon molecule. Pause again. What I'd like you to do is answer what's the main function of the Calvin cycle? Where does it occur? What are the reactants and the products? Oh, I never really finished that thought. The carbon cycle, or the Calvin cycle, I'm sorry, has to happen twice. And then two of these G3P molecules will combine to create one 6-carbon glucose molecule. Sorry, I thought I had one more slide that stated that clearly. So the Calvin cycle has to occur two times to give us one glucose molecule. All right, so the importance of photosynthesis. For plants, they need the glucose produced by photosynthesis for cell respiration. And they use it also to build their bodies or to produce cellulose, which makes the structure of a plant. On a global scale, photosynthesis is really important for transforming the atmosphere and producing oxygen gas. It also provides a food source for everything that's a heterotroph, or things that can't do photosynthesis and feed themselves. They're the base of the food chain. All right, so review of photosynthesis. We've got our light-dependent reactions. There's photosystem 2 and photosystem 1, where those electrons get excited by sunlight. They jump up in energy, they bounce down the electron transport chain and produce ATP, which runs the Calvin cycle. They also produce or harvest electrons, which are carried by NADPH to feed into the Calvin cycle. These things interact with carbon dioxide gas coming in through the stomata on the bottom of the leaf to produce G3P, a three carbon molecule. This needs to happen twice, so it takes two goes through the Calvin cycle to make a six carbon sugar for export or starch for storage for a rainy day when the plants can't do photosynthesis. Water comes in, oxygen comes out. So you should know what the reactants are, the things that go into each set of reactions. You should know what the products are, the things that come out of each set of reactions. And you need to know that basic equation. All right, so let's make some comparisons between cell respiration and photosynthesis. Cell respiration is done by plant and animals. It, photosynthesis, however, 
most animals can't do. There are some protists um, that can, but uh, anyways, we think of that as being something that's more like plants, algae, cyanobacteria. <sighs> Cell respiration requires oxygen and food. Photosynthesis requires carbon dioxide, gas, water, and sunlight. Cell respiration produces carbon dioxide, water, and ATP and NADH. Photosynthesis produces glucose or food, oxygen, and ATP and NADH. Cell respiration occurs in the mitochondrial me membrane and matrix. Photosynthesis occurs in chloroplast thylakoid membrane and stroma. Stroma is the fluid that fills the inside of the chloroplast. Cell respiration uses oxidative phosphorylation and a proton gradient across the membrane. Photosynthesis also makes use of a proton gradient across the membrane in chemiosmosis. So by now you should know the basic chemical pathways of photosynthesis. You'll need to know the input and output of each step or the reactants and products at each step. In addition, you need to be able to produce that summary equation from memory. If you have any questions, make sure you jot them down, bring them to student office hours or class so we can chat about them. Thank you for watching.